So for a quick overview of the rest of the semester, uh, today and Friday are the last two days of actual content. We're going over graphs and breadth first search today. And on Friday, we'll talk about using breadth first search and graphs to be able to do task finding, which will be the main focus of the last homework. Last homework assignment will be uh, what you've started in lab. Here's a starting point and an ending point and a grid with some tiles that you can't move past. How do you move from point A to point B? Uh, how do you find that path? So it's all about pathfinding and the general solution to get full credit should be uh, an overall maze solver. If the map is, the grid of the map is laid out as a complete maze, your software should be able to get from point A to point B, should be able to find that path. Uh, and we'll learn all about that on Friday. Uh, Wednesday, of course, is the level four quiz. And then the rest of the days are mostly review, uh, no new content, and the, except for the last Friday, the last day of lecture is that last quiz, the MMO quiz. There's no quiz five, uh, but quiz five, what would be quiz five, will just be part of the final exam. The final exam will effectively be like all five quizzes all put together for one exam. So there will be a section for each level. It will be like the four quizzes you've seen plus a fifth quiz for level five. On uh, today and Friday, there are no, or, sorry, today and Friday are two lecture questions. There will be one more lecture question after that. It will not be on Monday. It won't be on next Monday. It's most likely going to be the following Wednesday, that Wednesday of the last day of class. Ooh, is that a good idea? I don't know. I'll, I'll figure out something with that. It won't be next Monday, though. So next Monday, the Monday before break, no new content, no lecture question. Uh, I won't stream it. There, uh, there won't be anything that you absolutely need to know during that lecture. So take that for what it's worth. Uh, and with that, any, any questions? And then we'll just get into graphs. Yep. On the website, there's a uh, consensus suite for this project, level three, and then it also says there's a multiple project, level three. Yes. Uh, thank you for mentioning this. I, I meant to say this in my rainbow in there. Uh, project demo three is this week and the week after break. So, um, and I outlined this way at the end of the demo three documentation. There's some description, so if I leave out some details, check that out. But if you demo this week in your lab section, you get an extra 25 points on your demo three. That's an additive, that's just a plus 25. There's no cap on that point, so if you demo this week, and get full credit, you have a 225 for that demo. So it's an extra 25 points that I kind of snuck in, it's added to the course. There's an extra 25 points available. So if you're looking at trying to skip the exam and you're trying to figure out how many points you can miss and whatnot, there's an extra 25 points out there that I didn't really advertise too much. So that's my incentive to get you to demo this week. I highly, highly encourage you to demo this week instead of putting it off until the week after break. <laughs> Because the week after break, uh, first you're not going to get that 25, that's my incentive to try to actually get you to, to demo this week. Um, you don't get that 25, plus you have a homework that's going to be due. You're going to be do the, doing the pathfinding homework that last week of classes. So don't put demo three and the pathfinding homework both in the same week. Don't do that to yourselves. Uh, that's a very rough week uh, if you do both of those the same week. So right now, when there's no homework out there, there's nothing really pressuring you from this course, do that demo three, get it done this week with the extra 25 as the incentive and try to get that done. And, uh, and even if you don't really have anything, just how you should, should play the game of this course, even if you don't have anything, it, still demo this week. Still demo, even if you just walk up to your TA, show them your lab, uh, lab eight code, which could have only been one line. Just show them that and say, I got nothing. And get a 25 at least, get a 25 on the books. Because uh, you get the extra 25. It, if you demo both weeks, it's the max of those two scores. So if you have nothing this week and you show your TA nothing, get 25. And then next week, you just focus on the homework and your other courses, you just don't find time to do the project, you at least have your 25 locked up. So at the very least, do that. Uh, so show up, do something, show anything to your TA this week. Uh, that's what I recommend, that's what I would do. Get at least a 25, because it's the max. You demo both times, you get the max of those two scores. Uh, so don't waste that opportunity to demo this week, even if you don't really have anything. And hey, maybe you'll 
uh, almost accidentally get some points for one category and get more than that 25 uh, and get some points locked up uh, and then if something does go wrong that last week of classes you have that to fall back on so I recommend doing that everyone should demo both weeks uh, unless you get over 200 this week of course you wouldn't demo again Uh, so, and there will be, so there's two more lecture questions, there's one for today, one for Friday, and another one, it'll be sometime during that last week, I don't know, I, I was thinking Thursday, or Wednesday, but I don't really want a Wednesday because it's due the same night as the homework, uh, but I'll figure out another way to, to get another 20 points out there. Those will be three 20 pointers for another 60 points, that'll bring us up to a four, uh, 400 total, that was my target, is to get 400 total lecture question points out there, they cap at 300 so you can miss 100 lecture question points and still have uh, that category maxed out. All right, any other questions before we get into graphs? All right, second to last lecture of content. Let's do it. It's a dag equal a dab. I mean, good. Uh, so, lecture question given a graph in two nodes. Are those two nodes connected? We'll have to learn some vocab before we get there. Uh, to understand what this is asking, are two nodes in a graph connected? First, let's review the data structures we have. We're going to, of course, learn a new data structure today, graphs, which is kind of a combination of a couple of data structures. Uh, but let's review what we have so far. So we have a few sequential data structures. We have arrays, which are one continuous chunk of memory, and uh, pieces of data are sequential in that chunk of memory. And we saw a linked list. This is similar. It's a sequential data structure. All the elements are ordered, except now they're not sequential in memory. There's not one big chunk of memory. We have uh, data all over memory, and each piece of data contains a reference to the next piece of data in the list. So to navigate this list, we have to hop all over memory, and we have to go have linear operations, O of n operations, if we want to just traverse this list or find a certain element in the list, because we need to follow those references to get around. Then we had key value stores. We haven't focused on too much. I mean, we use maps this semester, but we really didn't talk about them. They weren't a huge focus point. They were just when you needed a key value store, you would use a map. Uh, but we learned about these in 115. This is when you want to store data at a particular key. So if you want some keys and store values at those keys with this key pair association, this associative data structure, we would use our maps in Scala, our dictionaries in Python, our objects in, in uh, JavaScript. We would use that kind of key value pair data structure. There's no meaningful ordering with these. We just have keys associated with values. These are usually stored as hash tables. We have O of 1 lookup for a key, O of 1 insert, uh, O of 1 delete. We have some nice properties, but there's no meaningful ordering here. We can't, uh, say, sort a map. Doing something like that doesn't quite make sense. Uh, unless you use a certain type of map. There are, um, in Java or Scala, it would be tree maps, but uh, we don't need to go down to that. Go down. We don't need to go down there. Uh, then we learned about trees, where we have a structure very similar to a linked list, except that we can have more than one nest uh, reference. So here we only talked about binary trees, where each node can have 0, 1, or 2 child nodes that it'll refer to. But these can branch as much as you want. You could have trees where you, you branch out uh, to as many nodes as you want. So with these data structures in mind, what if we had this type of data? What if we have, say, intersections connected by roads? Say we have cities connected by train, uh, train tracks, stations, or airports. What if we have this kind of structure of our data? What if we have stations connected by subways? How do we represent this data with the data structures we have? So this is when we can have multiple connections from any node, and those connections can circle back around. So our first thought, without that last part, might be to use a tree. So the, use this example, the very early days of the internet, these were the only sites connected to the very early internet. What if we had these nodes and we said, 
Well, let's use a tree. We already have a tree that kind of captures this type of data. And let's pick an arbitrary starting point. We'll start at UCLA. And then build a tree that connects UCLA to all of its connections, Stanford, SRI, UC, uh, UCSB, and Rand, Randolph. Let's have those connections as a tree, and then just recurse. Go to each child node. So we'll go to Stanford and look at both of its connections and just have a recursive algorithm that just keeps traversing all of the connections to be able to find out all of the structure of this tree. We have a big problem when we do this though, is we're going to have duplicate data. So we start at UCLA, we're going to go to Stanford, but Stanford is also connected to UCLA, so we're going to revisit this and have this duplicate data in our tree if we just have a recursion that says visit all of the nodes. Now we could add a little bit of logic there that says, well, just don't go back to your parent node, but we're still going to have situations where we go around in circles and we're going to revisit those same nodes if we use this pure tree structure and just traverse, uh, have our uh, standard traversal that's just going to visit all of the connections. So we need to do a little bit more here. Chidden, damn it. Uh, <laughs> children, of course, that should be. Uh, so we need to do a little bit more here. Just a very subtle change to that algorithm is we're going to visit all of the connections of each node, but we're not going to duplicate any data. So we're going to keep track of all the nodes that we've already added to this data structure, and we won't re-add any data. And when we're coming back to a node, instead of, uh, so example, when we go to Stanford, instead of adding UCLA again, we're just going to add a connection back to the existing node representing UCLA. So we're just going to add in the connections to the existing nodes instead of creating new nodes for each new, uh, for each connection that we find. So for example, we start at UCLA, we're going to add all those connections. We go to Stanford, we add, we don't re-add UCLA and the connection's already there so we don't add anything new but we add SRI. When we go to SRI, we see UCLA again, so we're going to add that. Well, that connection was already there. But UCBS, we're going to find, and we're just going to add that connection to the existing UC, uh, UCSB node that we've already added when we explored Stanford. So now, when we build our structure in this way, we have our graphs. So this is a graph. We have our nodes, and we have our connections, and we found this by navigating this entire structure, this entire, um, the entire internet at the time, at this time, navigating that structure without duplicating any nodes, without duplicating any sites in this case, and without duplicating any of the connections. We're just going to use the existing nodes when we rediscover a node. So now we have all of this information captured in this structure. We still have a question of how are we going to represent this in our programs? How are we going to think about this? How are we going to talk about this? We're going to need a little bit of vocab to do that, and then we'll see the code how to represent it in our programs. Uh, and uh, we'll see BFS by the end of today. We also need some new algorithms to be able to work with graphs. We can't just use our tree algorithms because we're going to get stuck in infinite recursions. If we have Okay, start at UCLA and recursively call an algorithm or method on all of its connections. We're going to recursively call it on these four sites, and then for each one of these, we could, uh, we could omit the parent node or you know, we could have some extra logic there. But once we start going around this, we're going to start going around in circles with our recursion. We're going to have recursive calls that end up backing up on, a, on itself and just start getting in this infinite recursion. So we have to modify our algorithms a bit as well to make sure that we're not visiting a node more than one time as well. So we'll see an example of how to do that. But if we don't have extra logic, if we just start recursing down this, we don't have any, uh, any leaves like we have in trees. With a tree, we're always, as far as we go down the tree, we're eventually going to get to a node with two null references. And that's going to stop the recursion. Our base case looks for null and then starts returning back up the recursion. It's not the case here. We don't have any leaves, so we have to have some way to address that as well. 
the big way of how we're going to represent this, if you look at the graph, you can kind of think of this for linked lists and trees. Graph is kind of the general data structure that can capture both of those. Linked lists and trees can be captured with graphs. If we think about this way, we're going to start thinking about these instead of nodes and references to a next node. We're going to think about these as nodes and edges. So we have our nodes, which are our, our locations here, and then an edge, which means there is a connection between two of these locations. So we have all these sites, and whenever we draw a connection between them, we say that there's an edge between MIT and BNN in that case. There's an edge between BNN and Harvard, those two nodes. This is the terminology we use to talk about graphs. Nodes and edges are the big things, the two big definitions that we use whenever we're talking about graphs. So node, some data element, very similar to the linked list nodes, the tree nodes. We, we're used to that. It stores some part, piece of data, and it also contains some of the structure of the data structure. So usually these nodes for linked lists and trees used to store references to its uh, two neighboring nodes. Here we're going to expand that to a more general case and say there are edges that are lists of pairs of nodes, and we're going to say there's a connection between those two nodes if there's an edge connecting them. Right, any questions so far? This is, this is kind of the high level definition of a tree. We're going to start diving a little deeper into the details. Okay, so conceptually, I'd say we're we're feeling okay. Let's start seeing how to work with this in our code. How are we gonna code this up? How are we gonna write our algorithms? How are we gonna write methods in classes to work with this type of structure? So in this class, we're gonna look at an adjacency list. When working with graphs, there are two uh, very common ways to represent a graph, either adjacency list or an adjacency matrix. We're not gonna talk about adjacency matrix, so I'll leave that to Andy Hughes next semester. But adjacency list, we're going to talk about uh, in, this, uh, in this class. So an adjacency list for each node is going to contain a list of nodes for which there's an edge connecting those two nodes. So UCLA has an edge to these four nodes. So the adjacency list entry at UCLA is going to store those four nodes. And we go through for each one. SRI is connected to these four. It'll have those four nodes listed. Stanford only has two connections. So it's going to list those two in its adjacency list. So we're going to store an adjacency list, which is a map of nodes to nodes. Uh, so we're combining a few data structure here. Oh, sorry, a map of nodes to some data structure containing nodes. Commonly, uh, it can be a map of nodes to a list of nodes. So we're combining map and list, or map and or an array, whatever data structure you want to use. I'll use list in my code. Uh, and using that to represent all of the information in this graph. And we're also going to store the nodes separately. So we'll have a data structure with all the nodes, and then the adjacency list, which stores a map of nodes to all of the nodes to which it's connected. Now with this data structure, we can start thinking about our algorithms and how we're going to work with this data. So with the adjacency list, a graph represented as an adjacency list will look like this, at least in my example, um, in, the, in the repo. And for this example, I give each node uh, a unique ID. This is a common practice, common thing to do in programming. Whenever you have a lot of different pieces of data, it's common to give them a unique ID just to make sure that you can allow duplicates. If I have two nodes that just happen to have the same name or the same data, uh, for, the, for the last homework, you'll have, uh, you'll have each grid tile will be a node in a graph. Well, do you want to give each one of those grid tiles a unique name? They'll probably have the same values unless you encode like, the, their location on the grid or something like that. Uh, they're going to be very similar. So if you give them a unique ID, just some integer labeling their, uh, their ID, and make sure that those IDs are unique, we can make sure that we can allow any type of data, even if there's many duplicates, 
We can use those IDs to keep them separate, even if they have the same value. Yeah. Could and then use the location in the list. So if I just had a, a, a list of list of int, you mean? Oh, for the nodes? Map of, so if you have two values of A which are equivalent based on their dot equals method, if you just had a data structure storing those, so, uh, so you would want just a list of type A for the nodes, is that, that you're saying why wouldn't you do that? If you have two A's that, are, that have the same value, so according to their dot equals, they're the same, and you're trying to find a particular node, you'd have to differentiate between those two. You could do it by their location in the list, but now you have to have some other data structure that's storing some, giving some meaning to their location in the list. And, uh, you could use that location in the list as the unique ID, uh, and then have them stored here, have these ints match their location in the list, uh, but you're gonna lose some efficiency there. You're going, to, you're going to have to traverse that. Whenever you need the value of a node, you'd have to traverse the whole list. Um, you'd have to do an O of N operation to traverse that list and get that value. So you lose a little efficiency. You could still pull it off, and yeah, there are a ton of different ways we could, uh, we could represent this information. Um, but some ways we might lose efficiency. Even having this list here, we're losing some efficiency depending on our application. If we just want to know if two nodes are connected, for example, uh, I'd lose a little efficiency here. So it's all about trade-offs. Sometimes, uh, like I mentioned, adjacency list, and there's uh, an adjacency matrix we could use to represent a graph. A lot of times choices like that are up to your application. What are you going to end up doing with this graph? And then that's going to determine how exactly you represent it based on what operations you're going to most commonly be performing on that, uh, on that graph. And then making sure those common operations that you're going to be doing are, are efficient. So here I'm thinking I'm going to be looking up a lot of node values by its index. So I want this map that's going to give me O of one lookup based on a, a hash table implementation. I want O of one lookup. If I have an index, I want the value of that node immediately. Where a list I'd have to traverse that whole list. Uh, so just some trade-offs. Some of them, depending on application, can be arbitrary, but if you have an application where you're doing common, app, uh, common um, calling common methods, you want to make sure those are efficient. So here I'm giving each node an index, which I'm leaving up to the call. Whoever is using this graph, I'm going to have them keep their, um, assign their indices. So I should have called this ID actually. Assign that, that ID, that unique ID for each node that they create. And then they can look up that node by that index, by the ID that they gave it. To add edges, I'm only going to work with the indices. When we do the indices, another reason to, to have unique IDs and indices like this is every method I write to work with this data I don't have to care at all about what A is, what that type is. I'm just going to work with ints. I'm going to work with those IDs. And then all my algorithms are going to work with ints, just those IDs. And then whenever I need to look up a value, I'm going to go to this map and say, what's the actual value at this ID? This is the only place where I actually care about what the actual value at a node is. So it can, uh, it can make the algorithms a bit easier to write as well. So. With this data, with that graph that we saw on the previous slide, if I want to create a graph representing that data, I'm going to create IDs, just arbitrarily assign a unique ID to each node, just using 0 through 12 here, and then add all the edges by their IDs. So I want to add all the values of each node, give them a unique ID, then add each edge, but I'm adding the edges using their IDs, not their values here. And then in my add edge, I'm making sure that I add 
that new edge to the adjacency list twice. We do have a little bit of duplicate data for convenience. We're going to add it twice, once for the adjacency list of one of the ends of the edge and once for the other end of the edge. So the two nodes that are connected are going to both of their adjacency lists and adding that connection. Any questions on this structure? This is really the, the whole structure of a graph, and I'll start talking about BFS pretty soon here. So uh, I'll park right here for a little bit, make sure we're comfortable with what a graph is, how the structure is represented uh, in our code, these, this idea of nodes and edges. Make sure everybody's comfortable with this before moving to BFS. What does a disconnected node look like on that kind of graph? So if we just didn't, if we had a node, say case here, didn't have any connections, we would just sever these two, we would sever these two links, these edges just wouldn't be there, and we'd have a node just floating out by itself. And when we talk about breadth first search, we will actually see that. We're going to sever these two connections and run breadth first search uh, to find out if two nodes are connected. And then we would have, and what would a disconnected node? So say we did sever those two nodes from case, this would just be empty. Uh, this would just be an empty list. So when we look up, what's case? When we look up 12, we wouldn't add these two edges. And then when we say, give me the adjacency list for 12, it would just give us an empty list. Let's do one quick definition here, a path in a graph, and then we'll go to, to BFS. A path in a graph is a list of nodes such that any two adjacent nodes in the path are connected by an edge. So this path, UCLA, SRI, Utah, if I start at UCLA, SRI, Utah, MIT, uh, oh, geez, I'm blind, BNN, and then RAND, Every adjacent, all, all, each two adjacent nodes in that path, in that list, are connected by an edge. There is clearly a path there. It's kind of the natural definition you would think for a path. You can get, you can navigate the whole path and their edges the whole way around. This SRI, Utah, BNN, well there's no edge between Utah and BNN, so that is not a path. Can't actually traverse that path. There's no actual connection. If we were trying to route packets through this, uh, through this old internet before it blew up in size, uh, we just can't send this packet. Utah can't send that to BNN. There's no connection. There's no cable laid between those two um, between those two locations. Can't do it. It's not a valid path. Uh, this one is because you can get there. EFS. So with BFS, what we'll, we'll focus on today is find, using BFS to find the connected component of a graph. So connected component is starting at some given node. We'll stick with UC, UCLA. Starting at UCLA, where can I go from there? What are all of the nodes that I can reach from UCLA? Which is to say, give me all of the nodes for which there exists a path from UCLA to that node. So in this graph, this is a connected graph, meaning that from any two nodes, you can travel between those two nodes. For the internet, this is exactly what we want. We want to be able to get from any one node to any other node, um, or else the internet isn't as useful as it can be. So what if we do disconnect this? Going to disconnect between Utah and MIT and RAND and BNN. And now, this is not a connected graph. We have two, what we call two connected components. We have one uh, chunk of the internet here. These sites can all communicate with each other. And another chunk of the internet here. These can all communicate with each other. 
Now with this graph, it's pretty easy to just eyeball that. We can look at this and see what's connected and what's not. We can see that, well, we can't get from SRI to BNN. We can get from SDC to UCLA. Um, but the internet's grown quite a bit since then. This is a graph, a very similar graph, similar structure of the internet, uh, more modern. I think this one's from 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but we can't eyeball this anymore. We can hope that this is all connected. I mean, probably is the internet's pretty good about that. But what if there are some servers that go down? What if something happens and we want to know, okay, what's still connected? We're not going to eyeball that anymore. We need some algorithm. We need to be able to train our machines to be able to do this because uh, the problems get a lot bigger, uh, a lot bigger than this for sure. So how do we solve this in general? This is where we're going to use BFS which is choose some starting node and then continuously explore all the connected nodes. That's the, the quick two-liner of this. So we're going to start at some node. We're going to go to the adjacency list and visit all of its neighbors. And then for each of its neighbors, each node that was added, we're going to visit all of its neighbors Except we have to be careful to avoid the problem that we would have with our tree algorithms. We have to avoid the infinite recursion. So what we're going to do is every time we go to a node and explore its neighbors, we're going to mark that as what we call visited. We're going to say this node has already been visited. Don't check this node again. So we're going to go to all these sites and explore all of their neighbors that haven't been explored yet. We're going to find these next two. And then we're going to keep repeating this until no new nodes are added. Once we go a whole round of adding, uh, adding nodes and no new nodes are added, we know we're done. We found this whole connected component. We're not making any more progress. So we're going to return that as the connected component. So any node that was added during that round of BFS, we're going to know that those nodes, that node was connected to the starting node. So all of these nodes we know are connected to UCLA. Yes, we knew that visually by, by eyeballing this, but in a big graph, we would run this BFS and be able to know if any two nodes were connected. So for the lecture question, starting at some node, start at one of the, the endpoints, run BFS, and if you ever explore the other one, you know they're connected. If BSS, BFS ends without ever exploring that node, not connected. So how do we do BFS in our code? That. So I give you the BFS algorithm, it, it's in the repo, but for the lecture question, I think it's my next slide, uh, for the lecture question and the last homework, you will have to significantly, well not significantly for the lecture question, but at least for the homework, you have to modify that code to be able to get it to suit your needs. Just out of the box, what I give you isn't going to do exactly what you're asked to do with it. But let's take a look at the out of the box BFS. So you have an idea, I want you to understand the concept of a BFS and then know how to apply it to solve whatever problem you're asked to solve. For the lecture question, are two nodes connected? Run a modified, your modified BFS to be able to, to tell that. Slightly modified for lecture question. And for pathfinding, I'm not gonna give you any pathfinding code. You have to start with this BFS and modify it to be able to actually find a path between two nodes, which we'll talk about on Friday. So this BFS, given some graph, and a starting ID, start running BFS from that starting ID. So I'm going to store two data structures here, my explored set, so what nodes have I visited, and I'm gonna mark my start node as visited immediately. I'm gonna use a data structure that I, I think I mentioned in one or two lectures in passing, but we never really used it, a set. Uh, this, is, this is a set, how you know it from CSE 191, if you're taking that class or if you've already taken it, it's a data structure that does not allow duplicates. So I'm using a set of ints. The ints are the IDs of the nodes. I'm careful when I create my graphs to make sure that the, node, the IDs are unique so I don't have to worry about duplicates. But if I do happen to add the same node to the set twice, which I might do in my algorithm, uh, I'm counting on the structure of a set to be able to get rid of that duplicate. If I try to add the same node twice, it's not going to add it twice, it's just going to add it once to this set. So I'm going to use a set just to deduplicate all of my, uh, my node IDs. And since they're unique IDs, I know I'm not actually deduplicating duplicate data. It's 
poorly worded, but, but if I do have two nodes, I won't have two nodes with the same ID, so if there is a duplicate, I know that that was the same node, so I'm okay with that. It's already explored. If I explore it again, the set will just not add it again. So it's going to be a very efficient data structure for my use, uh, for what I'm using it for here. And then to explore, this is the, I need to track the nodes that I'm about to explore. What nodes am I going to explore? And for this, we're going to use a queue. Every time we find a new node that should be explored, we'll add it to the end of the queue and start exploring nodes from the beginning of the queue. So I want this queue structure. I want everything to be, uh, be in this first in, first out order. That's how I want to explore my nodes. And we'll leverage that in pathfinding on Friday. We really want this to be a queue. This is not a queue. We're not running press or search uh, anymore. For example, if we swap this out for a stack and do a few modifications, we'll be running what's called depth, depth first search, which is another thing that we're not going to talk about in 116. I just want to give you a taste of this stuff. So a queue, we're going to get the order of visiting the nodes that we want for this. So, and then initialize the queue with our starting node. And then while the queue is not empty, this is how we're going to have our, our exit condition. As soon as we explored everything we're supposed to explore, get out of there, we're done with the algorithm. So while there's something left to explore, we're going to grab the first node in the queue, explore all of its neighbors if the node was not already explored. So if we're looking at a node that hasn't been explored yet, add it to the queue to explore, and then add it to the explored set. So the explored set is going to get duplicates. If I have a node that's already in my queue, and I visit a node that is also connected to that node that's in the queue, so in the queue but not yet explored. Actually, no, I am marking it as soon as I add it to the queue. So I guess I don't really use that set. Well, anyway. Um, but we're going to add, explore all of its neighbors, add its neighbors to the queue if they haven't already been explored, and then keep going through the queue, exploring the neighbors. So this is how I'm getting rid of exploring nodes more than once. I don't want to check a node's adjacency list more than once. It's going to keep exploring its adjacency list until we're out of stuff to check. So if I start at UCLA, I'm going to add all these four to the queue. Then I'm going to visit Stanford, UCLA, and SRI. UCLA was already visited, was already explored, so we're going to skip that one. SRI is already in the queue, so we're going to skip that one and do nothing. SRI, we're going to add, be careful here, Utah. We're going to add Utah to the queue. We're going to visit UCSB, add RAND. No, we're not going to add anything to the queue. Visit RAND. Add SDC to the queue, and then we'll go to that. Uh, I lost track of this. Where was I? Utah would be the next one in the queue, right? Yeah, Utah would be the next one in the queue. Visit Utah, and then keep going until the queue is empty, until we don't add anything, uh, until we emptied out the whole queue and didn't add anything new to our explored set. Then we know we're done, we've explored everything, and uh, the way we've structured this, we can be sure that this is not an infinite loop. If we're not properly checking nodes as explored, or if we're not checking them as explored at all, this is just going to be an infinite loop. We're going to keep running circles around this, uh, around this graph, around the cycles. But since we're going to empty out this queue because of the way we're marking these as explored, we're not going to get that infinite loop. We're only going to explore the connected component, whatever's connected to the start ID, and then that's it, and then the program exits. So here, I, all I'm doing when I explore a node is just print that it's being explored. This is where you would want to do something. Uh, for the lecture question, you just got to make a quick change to this. Uh, for pathfinding, we'll make some more significant modifications to this to get it to do what we want it to do. Any questions on this?
All right, we'll have a little bit of time if you want to ask me questions, or we have three TAs today. If you want to ask the TAs questions, uh, come on down. Other than that, I'll see you Wednesday.